Hello, and welcome to our panel on transitioning Canadian energy. I am your moderator, Lynn Dwan. I'm the managing editor of Bloomberg's Energy and Commodities Coverage across the Americas. I am joined here by Max Chan, Vice President of Treasury and Enterprise Risk at Enbridge Inc., a very well-recognized company in the space of energy transition, transportation and distribution, and Alan Grant, Chief Operating Officer of the Calgary-based energy services company, Secure Pure Energy Services. As the name of the panel implies, we are here to discuss what has really proven to be a worldwide energy transition and how the Canadian energy industry fits into that as well as how to finance it. So with that in mind, let's start with a very broad question for you, Alan. The energy transition can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Tell us, what has it meant for your company and your clients? What are you and they doing to respond and to take advantage of the pressure to transition. Well, thanks for having me today. Uh, maybe I'll start off by just explaining what Secure Energy does as a, as a company. We have two major business segments. We have a midstream infrastructure segment where we treat, recover, dispose, and transport a lot of production water and oil uh, for our producers. And we have an environmental solutions business where we manage a lot of byproducts of oil and gas through recycling to remediation to reclamation and decommissioning. Effectively, we're managing a large part of the environmental liability and any impact to the environment. And I would say when we think about Canadian energy companies, I would consider us world leaders when it comes to environmental stewardship. You know, we have the skills, we have the expertise, and we have a, a regulatory environment here where we're all very well aware of what needs to be done uh, as we move forward in the transition phase. And I would say our focus is around scope one, GHG emissions that are, are directly incurred by the, by the business, scope two emissions that are indirectly, this is, uh, you know, electricity that you would use for your processing operation, the heat, and scope three, other indirect emissions such as transportation costs. And I would say today, Canadian companies are investing capital to reduce and improve how they uh, look at their emissions. Uh, I'll look at Secure, for example, on, on our electricity, our power consumption. We, look, we have a number of facilities across Western Canada. You know, we spent a lot of time on our energy consumption and looked at when we were using peak power uh, at these plants, and we determined that we could reduce uh, you know, our facility usage by 30% uh, in terms of power by just moving it to um, uh, processing our operations at, at midnight versus doing it during the day. And when I think about our customers, they're also investing in whether or not they want to reduce their power consumption, but also look at things in terms of like carbon capture and how they can reduce, um, reduce their overall GHG emissions. Thank you, Alan. And Matt, let's bring this over to you. Uh, you. You were the kind of company that secure um, services. What type of technologies does Enbridge see as most promising in bringing down the Canadian energy sector's emissions? Yeah, thanks, Lynn. So there's a number of technologies that Enbridge is, is pursuing. Some uh, might surprise people a lot longer than others. So we've actually been investing in renewable energy for 20 years now. Um, we have solar, wind across North America and, and throughout Europe, and it's a portfolio that's uh, almost $10 billion these days. So renewables has probably been the longest standing part of the Enbridge um, asset base in terms of energy transition technologies. However, more recently, a lot more conversation and investment around things like renewable natural gas, hydrogen and uh, carbon capture, as Alan mentioned. So a lot of exciting opportunities there, and we're piloting a number of these um, within parts of our business today. You know, another question for you in terms of financing this, these technologies, how does Enbridge and the rest of the Canadian energy industry find the money to bring about the transition that investors are asking for? What is the role of capital markets in this? Yeah, good, good question. Good timing, Lynn. So I guess the, the primary source of cash flow for Enbridge is still from our existing asset base. So the, the business that's there today, part of the proceeds and cash flow that's generated is to fund new technology and, and um, a number of these new initiatives. Um, but timing-wise, uh, as I mentioned, good timing. We issued the first sustainability-linked bond 
uh, from our sector in Canada just a, a week ago. And so we're starting to see the emergence of sustainable finance as truly a, a large and significant asset class. We issued the first sustainability link bond for our sector back in June into the U.S. tech capital markets and, uh, and like I said, last week into Canada. So I think what it's shown is that investors have uh, amassed and formed a lot of capital around this, want to deploy it, want to be part of the solution. So I think the capital markets are clearly gravitating towards um, helping finance these types of solutions for companies that are responsible and leading edge on this. All right. And, you know, uh, I'm speaking to two Canadian energy companies today because this is the Canadian fixed income conference, but I am interested in knowing why Canada has a unique special role to play in the global energy transition. Ellen, do you want to take that question first? What, you know, what position um, is Canadian Canadians energy uh, industry in in order to help bring about a global change? Well, I think, um, you know, when we think about global change and you think about all the environmental and regulatory standards we have in Canada, Canada is one of the most highly regulated uh, jurisdictions when it comes to oil and gas production. We've been doing it for a number of years. And, and when we think about uh, the regulatory environment here, we're, we're stewards of it. We, we, we take pride in, in, in production of oil. We've refined our process year after year. And wanted to show improvement improvements in terms of how we go about uh, you know extracting oil and gas. We've moved to pad drilling where we're doing these deep horizontals. We're recycling water. We're reducing our flares uh, that you're seeing at some of these production facilities. And one area we're working specifically with our customers on reducing GHG emissions is on, on pipelines. And we're looking at water pipelines, production water pipelines, and oil pipelines because we want to take trucks off the road. These diesel trucks create a lot of emissions today, and our, our producers know that if they put volumes on a pipe, it's the most efficient way to transport oil and water. Um, our East Kabob oil gathering line that is now a year and a half into operation, we move 12,000 truckloads uh, annually off the road and save nearly 15,000 tons of CO2 equivalents. So ultimately, we have the expertise and the means to be able to reduce emissions. And if you think about how oil is so significant in terms of the amount of energy we use on a daily basis, the last economical barrel of oil, because we're so environmentally responsible, should come out of Canada. You know, Ellen, you brought up some interesting points about how well positioned Canada's energy industry is in taking advantage of this transition. That said, I've got to say that the first thing that many think about when they think Canada and energy is carbon intens intensive oil sands. This is a sector that some companies have decided to pull out of and some investors have decided to divest from altogether. Max, tell me why the divestment movement poses a challenge for the industry in transitioning? Yeah, I think the issue with transition it takes a lot of capital. I think we all acknowledge it takes time, um, but it takes significant investment and significant capital. And quite often, it's the companies that are closest to the ground, so to speak, uh, are the ones who are leading edge in terms of developing that technology. I've talked about things Enbridge is, Enbridge is doing, but a number of our customers, particularly in the oil sands, are also leading edge on reducing emissions in their own operations. There's a lot of conversation and investment now forming around carbon capture. And so in many ways, when you, if you consider divestment of a sector just broadly, you're now both limiting the amount of capital and also increasing that cost of that capital to companies that are investing in energy transition technologies. And I think that's actually counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish. So, so I think just a broad-based divestment um, position is, is probably a bit misguided. I don't think it's the most constructive for well, I think what ultimately people are trying to get to is encouraging and fostering more innovative and cleaner technologies. So um, definitely think there's better ways to do it. All right. So divestment isn't the answer is what you're telling me, Max. If investors and, 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 and people who are looking to finance the energy transition in Canada are going to actually put money toward it and help with help bring it about, 
what are the metrics for them to use? Um, what would what would both of you recommend by way of measuring companies and deciding which ones to back based on an energy transition strategy? Ellen, why don't we start with you and then same question to Max. Yeah, great, great question. And, um, you know, it's an area that it, it's very challenging to answer because we've got multiple frameworks that are out there today that exist. We have SASB, the Sustainability uh, Accounting Standards Board. We have GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative. You've got uh, the Task Force on, on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And when you look at all these frameworks, uh, we have a lot of reporting agencies picking different uh, applications of these frameworks and reporting on it. And there's really no consistency, no, no comparability. And I think what we need to do as an industry is we need to adopt a framework that we all adhere to, that we apply the same standards, the same measurements, so that you can look across a sector and understand which ones are ultimately doing the best job. And that's going to take a bit of time. I think we've moved uh, substantially in the last few years to at least have these frameworks and have the ability to report on it. But we need audited, audited frameworks and, and we need consistency applied so that you can actually take and measure how you want to put your capital to work. And uh, I think that will come. It just will take a bit of time. And Max, what about you? How would you yeah, respond so, to uh, that? Well, a couple of thoughts there. Alan, Alan's exactly right. There are so many different frameworks, so many different uh, you know, groups that are trying to score and provide ratings on uh, on companies' um, ESG performances. Uh, one one to mention in there as well is so you've got the credit rating agencies starting to to uh, provide ratings as well. So uh, yet another group. So I think Alan is right. There there probably needs to be a bit of a consolidation and a bit of standardization there, uh, which is probably just a function of maturity as, as this uh, continues to evolve. But in terms of your original question for KPIs and, and what matters, um, I can definitely talk to that because we have issued now three financings that have sustainability-linked KPIs to them. So we issued a sustainability-linked loan earlier this year, and now, as I mentioned earlier, two sustainability-linked bonds, one in Canada, one in the U.S. So... Ideally, we want to measure all facets of E, S, and G. So we have an E KPI in terms of reducing our, over, our emissions uh, by 2030. Enbridge has announced a net zero 2050 goal. We have an S component as well in there around employee diversity. And then we also have a G component as well for our uh, board gender diversity. So we think it's, it's, it's appropriate to have a full balance of that. I know E, the E part of the equation dominates the conversation most of the time, which is important and, and, and obvious. But we want to make sure that the S and G components also get uh, appropriate weighting because it is an important component of responsible energy companies that uh, I think sometimes gets overlooked in, the, in just purely an E discussion. So a number of the KPIs um, are set for us already out there, and we've we've gone as far now as to put significant money where our mouth is in terms of putting those targets out there and have direct implications to our finances. Well, that's good guidance. Thanks so much for both of you answering that question. Helpful to the investors out there looking for investments in the energy transition space. You know, I have to ask it because this is all we can talk about and this is all we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks. Are these energy crises that we're seeing in regions including Europe today, but also California in the midst of heat waves earlier this year and the Texas energy crisis back in February, March? Ellen, what does that tell us about the energy transition? A oh, great question. And I think there's some several good learnings here we can take away from these regions. And, you know, when you think about a good energy supply, it, it needs to be reliable, but it also needs to be provided at a reasonable cost. And I think, you know, when you look at California, they've been trying to conserve power. They've been faced with rolling blackouts for a number of years to manage their, their peak demand. You look at Texas in February of this year, they suffered a major power crisis due to cold weather where, you know, they had frozen turbines, their solar panels were not providing the energy that they needed. They had equipment that froze. So you had people had shortage of water, you had shortages of food and heat. These are major crises. Um, and then just recently here in the month of September, uh, you know, in the United Kingdom where the wind just didn't blow for a few days, 
you had consumers facing surging electricity bills. I believe, you know, they doubled in the month of September for, for the UK residents, and I think they're seven times higher than they were a year ago. So these are substantially, uh, you know, factors when you're considering moving towards renewable energy. I think you got to look at it, whether or not it's, it's a reasonable cost for the long term for the consumer, because they are heavily subsidized by government, but they also need to be reliable. I mean, when you see jurisdictions like the UK firing up coal plants to be able to meet their, their peak demand, it showcases we can't move too quick, too fast. And we have to be very methodical about how we approach energy because it does have to be reliable. Now, you mentioned wind and its role in the Europe energy crisis, and I must also note that the other resource, of course, that played a major role is natural gas and the lack of supply at the moment in that region. Max, I'll, I'll pose this question to you. What role does a national government, in your case can Canada's government, play in both ensuring that there is enough energy resource around to keep the lights on, but also ensuring that an energy transition is actually brought about? What does the government do? So I think it's really at a very high level, the way we think about energy transition, it's not a binary outcome. I think quite often the conversation um, ends up as a binary. You're either for fossil fuels or against fossil fuels. Whereas the way we think about um, energy transition, which I think how governments need to think about as well, is it's it's a portfolio and it's a shifting portfolio over time. So as time goes on, the portfolio mix of energy sources changes from less fossil fuels to more renewables, more cleaner options. But it's not or, it's not this binary outcome. So I think governments need to uh, understand that that it's a portfolio mix and supporting all of those options. As Alan described, there's scenarios around the world playing out real time here as to what happens when you try to cut off, uh, you know, low cost proven reliable sources without proven reliable and cost effective alternatives. It, you know, you do set yourselves up for these, these crises and, and these are real, um, consequences this is these are not uh, luxuries here this these are the basic uh, you know basic necessities of, of life in a lot of these places to be able to, to be able to heat your home uh, be able to turn on electricity etc so I think for governments it's understanding that it's a it is a portfolio mix it's not these binary often politicized uh, situations and, and it does take a, a little bit of everything. Sure, absolutely. And just speaking of, about, you know, um, what the future energy mix is, uh, there is, of course, a lot of debate over the role of natural gas in the future as we transition away from more, more carbon intensive resources like coal and oil. Well, what do you see, Alan, as the future of natural gas and LNG? Uh, great, great question. I think, you know, when you look at, at natural gas and you stack it up against other forms, uh, uh, you know, other carbon intensive coal uh, to, to oil burning facilities, natural gas is, is probably the lowest in terms of uh, CO2 that it does emit. And we have an abundance of natural gas. It's clean, clean burning, it's safe, it's reliable. And when you think about Canada's role, and, and even in Northeast BC, you know, we're taking it to the point where we're liquefying natural gas and, and we're helping out other jurisdictions that, that don't have access to LNG for that low cost, reliable fuel source. They're going to need for the future as we try to transition, which are the most economic, economical renewable sources that are out there. So LNG plays a huge part in us as a, as a global entity and, and in Canada, as reducing our emissions on a yearly basis, natural gas will play a big part of that. 